Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Alan Hu Foundation Mental Health Lectures Series. My name is Chi Ching Hu. I'm the co-founder of Alan Hu Foundation. The foundation's mission is to promote mental health, raise awareness, and remove stigma surrounding psychiatric disorders, and support fundamental research for cures. It is our honor to co-host this evening's event with Las Pazitas College Psychology Club and in partnership with Lyra Goose of Stanford Medicine. Here is Dr. Robin Roy from Psychology Club. I just wanted to take a moment to welcome everyone to Las Positas College. We are very thankful that you're all here with us tonight. And we are also very, very thankful to be collaborating with the Allen Hu Foundation. Uh, so uh, like was mentioned, I'm one of the co-advisors for our psychology club here on campus, which is a very active club that our main mission is to really promote mental health awareness. So it was a perfect fit with us working with the Allen Hu Foundation. And again, thank you once again for being here. And um, we very much look forward to Dr. Joshi's talk. It is our honor and privilege to have Dr. Shashank Joshi here to give us a lecture. Dr. Joshi is a professor of psychiatry, pediatrics, and education at Stanford University. Dr. Joshi is a director of training and director of school mental health services in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Stanford Children's Health. He has been recipient of numerous awards in teaching and the public service, including Tolltree Award from the City of Palato, Chamber of Commerce, and Ensemble Hero Award from Santa Clara County, California, Mental Health Board, both for his work in stigma reduction and suicide prevention. Dr. Joshi's research focuses on well-being promotion and the suicide prevention in school settings, cultural aspects of pediatric health, and interprofessional collaboration in schools. Dr. Joshi is the lead author of K-12 Toolkit for mental health promotion and the suicide prevention used by California Department of Education and co-editor of the recent book, Partnerships for Mental Health, a guide to community and academic collaboration. Today, Dr. Joshi will present a lecture on the topic, Promoting Mental Health in School Settings. There will be 30 minutes uh, Q&A session after the presentation. Our volunteers have distributed the index card for you to write down questions. Your question will be collected and answered in the Q&A session. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Joshi. Thank you so much, Chi Cheng and Xiaofan, and um, Lyra, Dr. Roy, and all of you for coming out here on this chilly night. Um, I was just um, very impressed with the whole setup here, and um, I really appreciate our folks and the good folks in the booth. So I'm gonna be, hopefully, I'm gonna be speaking, the slides are behind me, and I'm gonna be kind of sliding along on my phone here, so I hope that's okay. <clears throat> I am getting over a little bit of a, <clears throat> a little cold and cough. I haven't been traveling to Asia. <laughs> <laughs> so just bear with me. Um, so I'm really honored to be with you all in honor of Alan. And I got to learn Alan's story <clears throat> over the past several months and um, got to know Chichen and Xiaofang and the work of the foundation. And so I just feel so privileged to be able to be here with you all today and also share some ideas 
and hear from you all and learn from you. I can see that there are lots of young people from middle school to high school and college and beyond, and so um, I'm hoping that we can have some conversation. Um, so what I'd like to do is, I'm gonna have to look at my slides sometimes to figure out what I'm actually talking about, because the slide's behind me. Um, these are the obligatory disclosures, so I don't have any um, financial conflicts related to this talk, but I do get support from the Lucille Packard <clears throat> Foundation and the Stanford Graduate School of Education. And I always like to start with, in well-being, we really worship at the altar of gratitude. And this work would not be possible without a number of partnerships that you see on the slide behind me. <clears throat> so I've been doing school mental health work my whole career at Stanford. It's my 21st year there. And when people ask me, you know, how do you get started in school mental health? And I know there's a lot of future psychologists here in the audience. It is all about relationships. It takes about a year to get into a school. And, you know, you gotta just show up. You gotta be there with your business card. You gotta be there. You gotta share your cell number with the school administrator and with the teacher. And you don't have to have all the answers. Um, but you can be a thought partner when it comes to, um, in our line of work, <clears throat> children and youth who have trouble accessing the curriculum because of a mental health issue. So in our work in schools, we talk about the idea that mental health is part of overall health. And children have to be healthy enough to learn. So for the superintendents who are kind of hard to convince that we should be taking instructional time to teach about mental health, we just kind of continue with this idea, mental health is part of overall health, children have to be healthy enough to learn, and oh by the way, healthy brains make better students, and then we're likely to come to class and engage. So part of the lesson we've learned is, depending on who the stakeholder is, you have to speak their language. Why should they care about this particular area? So for administrators, we like to talk about this idea of getting kids healthy enough to learn. <clears throat> this last bullet here, that's our newest partnership. Oh, the news comes out. Check that out. Um, so this, the Herd Alliance, this is an acronym for, it doesn't, really stand for this, but bear with me. It's Healthcare Alliance in Response to Adolescent Depression and Related Conditions. Not really heard, but close, right? The Herd Alliance. Um, this is a group of pediatricians, um, mental health specialists, and school specialists who came together after the tragedies we had in the communities of Palo Alto and San Mateo County and Santa Clara County in 2009-10, and we just came together to share ideas and best practice. <clears throat> and what turned in, what arose from suicide prevention is a lot of well-being promotion and a number of strategies that have been shared now around the state, and I'm gonna share some of those with you. And Santa Clara County <clears throat> has done a wonderful job of engaging all 32 school districts, so we have partnerships now with almost 29 of them, and we are training them in how to promote mental health, how to promote well-being, and also what to do in a crisis, what is the best practice, how do you create a safety plan, how do you have a re-entry meeting after a young person is hospitalized or comes to the emergency room and needs to come back into school, and if there is a loss in a community, what does one do, because postvention all the things that happen after a death is also linked to prevention. So, big shout out to these folks in Santa Clara County. <clears throat> so my hope for you all 
is in the next 45 minutes, you will be able to list some protective factors in youth well-being and suicide prevention as it relates to schools and as it relates to communities. You will be able to describe effective strategies that involve school community partnerships. And I realized I met Las Positas um, College here, but most of our work is focused on K through 12. So um, I am gonna make some reference to transition age youth, 18 to 25, I know there's a number of you in the audience. Most of the talk today will be focused on K through 12. <clears throat> and then I hope that you will be able to think about cultural opportunities and barriers that are important to keep in mind if you are trying to implement school-based mental health interventions. How many of you in the audience know that in the state of California, we actually have two laws that allow us to teach about suicide prevention and mental health promotion in schools? How many of you knew that? So we have a lot, a few people. It's AB 2246, which is the Pupil Suicide Prevention Policy. That means every school district in all 58 counties has to have a suicide prevention policy and board regulations for how to implement it. And it was just seven through 12, and this last fall it became K through six. So now we actually have a mandate from the state to do this. <clears throat> and so this has been our work. Okay, on the next slide, <clears throat> I'm gonna highlight some work of one of our amazing graduate students and his name is Noah Feinstein. You can't really see the reference, but he published this work a little more than 10 years ago, <clears throat> American Journal of Psychotherapy, and it's called The Supporting Alliance and Primary Therapeutic Relationships, and it's all about what happens when we have a student with an identified mental health condition. Who are those trusted adults in the life of that student? Now, Noah at the time, by the way, Noah just became, just got tenured at the University of Wisconsin, but he was a grad student at the time, and he was interested in his dissertation about how parents of children with autism engaged with science. <clears throat> so where do they get their information? Were there some favorite websites? Their cousin Ruthie, the neighbor, Scientology, where do they go? He was just very interested. It was a qualitative study. And he found a lot of interesting things. One of his most important findings was that these trusted adult figures, parents, we think about them first, right? But teachers and school staff, doctors and therapists. And when we think, who is the trusted adult who has the most meaningful contact to make a difference? in the life of a child with autism, we think it's parents. I'm setting this up now, but is that the answer? Which group? Who said that? Somebody said it. Which group is it? Which? It's teachers, right? So, <clears throat> how many of you are parents of teenagers, raising teenagers now, or you've raised teenagers? Okay, how many of you once were teenagers? <laughs> so, it's, it's a little different. When you're a parent of a child and you walk onto a campus, oh, the teacher loves to see you, right? They're like, Lyra, you're here, oh, you want, it's so wonderful, you know, we just love everything that your daughter does. She is just amazing. And I can tell she's gonna be a, a famous jazz bassist someday. Now, would you mind just signing up to volunteer for this thing that's coming up here? And then, would you, you think you might wanna be the room parent? You know, like, there's all kinds of things for you to do, but when you are a parent of a middle schooler or a high schooler, and you walk onto campus, what happens? They call security on you. Right? They're like, what? what? There's a parent sighting in the uh, 
southeast corner of the quad, what do we do? Um, parents start to feel shut out, in particular, if they have a child, in Noah's case, if your child has autism, in the case of, in our case, we have a middle schooler who needs an IEP because they're having mental health issues, in the case of my patients, right? So parents have to stay involved, but there's a partnership with teachers and school staff that's necessary. Obviously with doctors and therapists, what we try to do in our program, I run a training program for child psychiatrists, is we try to enable this relationship, the doctors and therapists with the school staff. Because as future psychologists or therapists, counselors, psychiatrists, pediatricians, you, you get meager time with the student in your office. This teacher's got 35 hours a week in elementary school, and then, you know, 30 to 40 hours combined as they get older among different teachers. So that is why we focus on these bi-directional arrows. We also can't forget about the peers. Who are the people who know? I met a number of Alan's friends today, right? You, you may not have known how much Alan was struggling. However, we know that when it comes to mental health and stigma and propagating messages of hope, help, and strength, it's all about the peers. Peers know their friends when their friends are in distress and they have the most power to be able to get help for that friend, even though they, the signs may not always be obvious. But when they are obvious, friends can often help friends get help. So we've been studying the role of peers in the Supporting Alliance and paying attention to these bi-directional arrows. So you can see it's really kind of a community, right, between trusted adults and peers. That's essentially the Supporting Alliance. How many of you are studying psychology? Okay, like a third of the room or <clears throat> more, I know that Les Positas Psychology Club is sponsoring this, right? Um, so, trusted adults working with students and peers, that's the work of the Supporting Alliance. So how many of you have heard of the concept of the Therapeutic Alliance? So the Therapeutic Alliance is this idea that when I'm working with my, if I'm a patient, I'm working with my therapist, let's say I was in a study and they're looking at us, I'm the patient, here's my therapist and we're in therapy. What would you observe if there was a very strong therapeutic alliance? If you were in a, like a one-way mirror and you're talking to your supervisor, you're talking to Dr. Roy, oh yeah, that, that therapist gets that patient. What would you see? What would it look like? Anybody? You have to say something now, I'm gonna put the microphone. Trust. Trust. Very good. Okay. What else? Listening. Listening. What else? Eye contact. Eye contact. Right. So the therapist is conveying an interest in the patient, <clears throat> just like a teacher conveys an interest in a student. Just like the reason students say, I can't go to my parents, I tell them something, they're always trying to solve my problems, I'm stressing them out more, I don't want to tell them because I'm just going to stress them out. Friends usually have an uncanny ability to listen. Just the things you mentioned, eye contact, trust, communication, right? These are the skills not only of beginning therapists, but in particular, other trusted adults, like teachers and school staff, and that has been shown in the research. So we're very interested in learning. How can we help teachers feel like, not that they're gonna be therapists for these students, but that they can be trusted adults and that their interactions can at least be therapeutic, particularly for a young person who might be in distress. How can they open a door to a conversation upstream, right? When stress is just starting, <clears throat> hey, you know what, I, I'm here, these are my office hours, I just wanna let you know. I'm here for you. If you ever want to talk, if you send me an email, we can set time up after class. If you give teachers the ability to do that and then give them some coaching about different situations, you've just increased teacher versatility. 
So now they feel comfortable. They know that if the student comes to talk to them, <clears throat> they don't have to be the therapist, but if there's some kind of crisis, they'll know what to do. That's part of what we do in our schools program, is we build capacity in schools by building versatility in teacher skill sets. So that's a supporting alliance. Thank you, Noah Feinstein. Thank you, American Journal of Psychotherapy. Um, they knew Noah was gonna be a star. And I was just around for the, I was just around to watch greatness. Krista Fielding, who's now a child psychiatrist in the community, doing wonderful work. Alice Ufari Solner, she's an academic in the School of Education. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I think my slides might be stuck. So, because I'm, I'm not able to advance this. So, is it possible to see the next slide? Okay, good. So, can we go back? <coughs> Good, thank you. Okay, there's a guy in Berkeley named Michael Riera. Any of you current parents who raised teenagers or used to be teenagers themselves? Have you heard of this guy? Michael Riera, he's amazing. He should be the next speaker, Dr. Roy. He's really good. He writes books about parenting teenagers. And we have three teenagers in our house, and this I grew up on this guy, he's amazing. He writes wonderful examples, thoughtful vignettes, and he's very relational. You know, it's all about staying connected to your teenager and, you know, not letting them push you away. <clears throat> and in particular, he talks about this concept of buffer zones. It's the idea that, like, we all go through stress, everyday stress here. So, x-axis, here's some examples. y-axis, you know, here's more stress the higher you are. So what's the number one issue for young people? Girlfriend, boyfriend, right? <clears throat> so your stress goes up and you go into your buffer zone. So then what do you do when you're stressed? What might you do? What do you do? This is full of young people. I'm talking to all the young people here. What do you do when you're stressed? What's the first thing you do? Cry. Sometimes that helps. Panic. Panic. Reach out to a friend. Talk with them. Talk with them or text with them. Or you would actually pick up the phone and call. I like this. He's an OG right here. He picks up the phone and calls. There's lots of ways to get a hold of a friend now. When I was growing up, it was like there was one phone in the kitchen with one cord. And if I wanted to talk to Marianne Lundin, I had to first get through her father, who would answer the phone, Mr. Lundin. Mr. Lundin happened to be the principal at my high school. But Marianne Lundin was the crush of my life. So I had to break through and go to my stress buffer zone. You know, exams, life transitions. Do many of you are going through this, those who are gonna graduate from here or who just graduated high school or middle school to high school, graduation, right? These are, these are everyday stressors. Young people typically can bounce back. But what happens if these everyday stressors in the context of these things called, Michael Riera calls them sedimented stress, the stuff that teens can't control, Traumatic events, divorce, death of a loved one, anniversary of a friend who died by suicide, financial stress, poverty, other factors out of the control of the young person. Then this everyday stress can look um, like if you go to the next slide, if you press the advance for the next, that looks, can you see that? See how it goes? into the buffer zone, past your stress tolerance level. And that's when kids start to think about desperate measures. <clears throat> the suicide rates in the country are going up, for the most part. Santa Clara County's rates have been going down. We don't exactly know why. There's probably not one reason. There's a lot of different things that they're doing at the county level. We know that suicide is the number one preventable cause of death in young people. Number one preventable cause, and yet, not every death will be prevented. Because 
sometimes it's too much for a young person. And often when we hear the story, we know that for some there may have been signs, for others there were no signs. So part of the work is to alleviate the burden of guilt that someone might feel like, if there was one thing I could have done, I should have done it, one thing I could have said. <clears throat> if you love that person and you're their friend, you, you probably did everything you could, and in spite of that, you know, severe depression is very formidable. So part of what we try to do in our work is to, again, equip peers and other, tr and other trusted people in the life of a young person to look for the signs. What's normal stress? What's not? How do I know when to worry? What's buffer zone stress? What's beyond stress tolerance? And how do I know when to worry? That's another part of our work. So we've studied protective factors. And here is, this is not our work. This is a, a sort of compendium of research over the last 20 years. Um, but we're interested in two areas in particular. I'm just going to review these very quickly in the interest of time. Some of these are, I think they're all intuitive. Family connectedness is really big, obviously. Positive relations between parent and child, but, and the right amount. Parental supervision, the just right amount. Not too much, just enough. I know their websites. We do tell parents until young people turn 18 to know the passcodes for their phone. I know, boo hiss, bring it, bring it, bring it, I know. But it's really, for young people, we're talking about 17 and under, it's important when they first get their phone as middle schoolers, this is fine, but you know, there's strings attached. So the right amount, not too much, but the right amount. Positive school connections, school climate, peer connections, perceived availability of trusted adults. This has to do with the idea that in one of the research questions we ask is, we ask people at big high schools to name their trusted adults at the school. Who would you go to if you were worried about yourself or a friend? <clears throat> and you start to see these patterns. Several teachers cluster together. There may be 10 or 15 in the school. They're mostly not counselors and psychologists. They may be the English teacher. They may be a coach, they may be someone else, but you see these trusted adults. And when young people list, the more that they list, the lower the risk for a school for having adverse events like 5150s and, and deaths by suicide. So it's the perceived availability, which is even more important than the actual availability. Hopefully the two match, but for young people it's like, you know, what's the number one predictor of whether they're gonna start juuling? in seventh or eighth grade. It's their perception of what their friends are doing. It's not necessarily what their friends are doing. The perception. We know that social support and connectedness is really important, not just in school, but also in communities. Connecting to something bigger than yourself. It could be a sports team, it could be a cause, but these opportunities are very important. We also know there's new research and old research looking at religiosity. So again, connecting to something bigger than yourself. One mistake that I think the California Healthy Kids Survey, how many of you heard of that? You probably took it, right? The Chick Survey? They only measure spirituality by asking you if you belong to a formal religion, religious organization, if you've been to church, and temple or synagogue in the last month, which misses all the kids who have some kind of spiritual life or spiritual belief or some kind of non-secular spirituality, not secular spirituality. But we also know that formal affiliation can be protective, and we know that beliefs against suicide that may be part of a community or culture can also help pr be protective. So the next few slides, I'm going to speak about what happened in Palo Alto. And <clears throat> so my wife and I have three boys, and we love living there. We, uh, I've, I've been a baseball coach for 12 years. You want to see children, youth development and mental health happening? Coach a baseball team. Coach a soccer team. Um, so much happens there. It's really taught me a lot. So it's this amazing community. And then in 2009, we had this series of tragedies. And then again, five years later. <clears throat> so what happened? 
Well, we formed this coalition, Project Safety Net Coalition. All of the adults wanted to do something to help it get better, to prevent the next tragedy from happening. So here's just a sampling. There's the city manager's office, and um, there's the Herd Alliance right there, and PTA Council, Santa Clara County, the YMCA, um, faith-based groups, team leadership groups, parent representatives, like everybody wanted to do something. But what, we weren't sure. So we kind of looked in the very beginning like this. Like, really well-intentioned, but kind of unstructured. And over time, what we learned is two important things. So remember the name of the talk is like lessons from the last 10 years and, and wisdom for the next 10. So I'm just gonna like throw these things out, um, especially because I don't have my notes in front of me. So if I had my computer, I'd be like, it'll be just kind of tipping me off. So I'm just gonna, I'm just speaking, just keeping it real. So I'll just share the lessons. One of them is, if you're gonna have Project Safety Net, which is the Palo Alto Collaborative, and you're all about youth, youth well-being, youth health promotion, youth suicide prevention, you gotta have youth at the table, right? So you can't have your meetings at 11 in the morning, 11 to one lunch meetings, great. What young person's gonna be able to come to that? So you have to have your meetings after school, something we learned, very important. And having young people at the table was crucial to us understanding what was going to work for the community, what was gonna work for school curricula. So over time, we started to look like this. We have young people in the middle. We have engaged adults in activated sectors, influencing civic decisions. How many of you grew up in a high school district where a student was on the school board. Okay, a few. Now, we have that in Palo Alto. It's this, the eighth seat. There's seven members in the eighth. She's a non-voting member, but she's there, and she speaks at every single meeting, and she's formidable. I mean, she's awesome, and grown-ups listen. So that's really crucial. And then invigorated programs, hopefully ones that have evidence they work. In our community, we've latched on to sources of strength as the number one well-being promoter, and it has a lot of data on suicide prevention and youth aware of mental health. Those are probably the two most robust programs. So, what does this remind you of? Does this look a little bit like Noah's diagram from the Supporting Alliance? Remember, young people and the students in the middle, right? You got adults. We had different sides of adults. Here we've got adults programs influencing civic decisions with activated sectors, all those organizations. This comes from the Search Institute. How many of you have heard of the Search Institute? They're responsible for developmental assets. These are the programs and the, the assets are the things that young people need to thrive. So they've done this throughout of Minnesota and they do a lot of community building and advocacy. Um, so this is where we went to. <clears throat> And, Dr. Roy, have they learned Bruff and Brenner yet? Yes. yes, they have. Good. She's studying for the final right here. She's got the midterm going. So, right, this is the nested social ecological model where you have the individual, student, family, peers, schools, workplaces in the community nested in a larger society. And this is what we were striving for <clears throat> when it came to Project Safety Net. And you can see, for example, these agencies that are nested in. So we, you know, we had a theoretical base that we were using to promote our programs. Um, so now I'm going to talk about school mental health. This is what I've been doing for 20 years, and every day I learn something new. So 65 million children and teens go to public school in the U.S. every day. Millions more are in private school or home school or online school. <clears throat> but 20% are suffering from some kind of diagnosable mental health condition. And many of these are not progressing primarily because of their mental health condition. Children of immigrants and immigrant children make up a quarter
quarter of our population. <clears throat> at the high school where my son goes, my eldest son, they asked at the beginning at parent orientation night, how many of you parents? Well, I'll just ask the question here. Um, of parents in the audience, how many of you went to high school somewhere other than the US? <clears throat> okay, so among the parents, that's like half of you, right? That's the numbers <clears throat> at my son's high school. It was like three quarters of the hands went up. So we make a lot of assumptions about the parents of the kids that we're trying to serve, and we forget that the parents have their own unique wants and needs for their own well-being to be able to help their young person thrive. So we have to pay attention to that. So just because we want to do school mental health doesn't mean it automatically happens. Even though we have a law in California, the problem is that counselors and other school staff may be unsure of their roles. Do I ask a question of this young person? What if I, what if I open that box? And what's gonna happen? They're gonna come and see me, and then I'm gonna have to say something, and I just don't wanna mess up. Oh, there's lots of nodding heads. Thank you for being my smiling, nodding heads here. So that's why we have to help teachers become more versatile. So the literature shows that if you can increase teacher self-efficacy, if you can increase teacher versatility for asking hard questions about kids are worried about, you actually increase their self-efficacy as a teacher overall. Because mental health issues are the stickiest, toughest ones. Because you're not sure if you want to ask, but you feel like you need to. Well, what kind of question would I ask? How would I start the conversation? There's a lot of work being done in that area now. And because of the California state laws, it's allowing us to really study this and see what works. Young people may not know, what are the signs that my friend is struggling from depression? When my 13-year-old, when our 13-year-old boy last year showed signs of depression, we didn't know. We didn't see it. It didn't matter that this is what I do for my living, for my professional work. When it came to my own child, I couldn't see it, probably because I didn't want to see it. It was his friends who saw it. They started texting us. They started sending us screenshots of the things he was posting. <clears throat> and that's partly because that the community that lost their young people turned their grief into positive action. They're very, we're a very destigmatized community now. So we have a lot of conversation about this. And we're starting the conversations in elementary and middle school. You know, we don't have kids making suicide attempts, typically in third or fourth grade. And yet, everyone needs well-being. Everyone gets stressed. Well, what's good stress? There's more good stress than bad stress most of the time. How do we bounce back and be stronger? Dr. Singh was here a few months back and talked about resilience, right? Resilience typically comes from dealing with adversity and growing and bouncing back. So this is better, but it's still an issue. There are developmental challenges to, we can't rely on the students to be the only ones to be able to tell when there's a problem. We also, um, may be stigmatized as peers. And in the surveys in our community in Santa Clara County as well, although we have about 90% endorsing between 80 and 90% at the end of one of our interventions saying, I would tell an adult if my friend were thinking about suicide, even if they told me to keep it a secret. 80 to 90%, but only 49% would be willing themselves to reach out for help. There's still a lot of stigma. <clears throat> so they may be unaware of signs of depression. So that's one of the reasons why. Why well, we use AB 2246 to get into the living skills classes to make sure every kid at least knows what is depression, the medical illness that can affect a brain that's more than just a little stress. And every teenager learns that in Palo Alto schools. Out of tragedy grew this opportunity. Out of the laws um, grew this opportunity. So we were able to overcome a barrier to help seeking. Now this is also from Noah's work. Okay? This is just a simple diagram about collaboration and teachers. How many of you are thinking about being teachers when you finish? Okay, 
Hold your hands up higher, be proud. Okay, <clears throat> any of you, so that's only about, like, I don't know, 30 or 40 of you. All of you who raised your hand at Psychology Club people, you are all gonna be teachers. You may not be classroom teachers, you're gonna be teaching with one another, you're gonna be teaching with your clients, you're teaching with your patients, if you go to medical school, there's teaching everywhere. And collaboration is so important, in particular for classroom teachers. So think about mainstreaming. <clears throat> mainstreaming is where all the kids are in one classroom, 30 or 35 kids, differential abilities, English language learners, fast kids, slow kids, kids who get it, kids who don't get it. Teachers have to do more and more with less and less. Mainstreaming necessitates new relationships, especially if you have 20% of your population is going to struggle with something diagnosable in the DSM that's probably gonna affect their learning. So they need relationships with doctors and parents, and we as doctors and parents need relationship with the teachers. So if we have good collaboration, right, mainstreaming increases classroom heterogeneity, I try to describe that, the different kinds of students. And so, if we have good collaboration between teachers and doctors and parents, good collaboration builds capacity, builds versatility, and increases what's called instructional tolerance. The idea that, yeah, I know I have this shit, I have this child with ADD in the corner, and I have three kids with special ed, and their teacher's out this week, and I have them, and I have these English language learners, and I have these other ones who are doing fine over here. But I can do this. I have mediated teacher stress because there are others I can call if I have a question. However, if we don't have good collaboration, we tax the teacher as a resource, and they have compassion fatigue by the end of the first semester, and they, they burn out, and they have frustration, and we have poor student outcomes, especially for teachers working in underserved districts who come and they want to devote their life to that work, but they don't have support from their administration. So back to the supporting alliance. It's just a reminder, we all have to work together. All the adults, in addition to the peers, they're bi-directional relationships, we're interdependent. It's village work. So I can't do it by myself as a therapist or a doctor. I need clinical eyes. Now you might say, but what about HIPAA? How many of you know about HIPAA? HIPAA, the great wall of HIPAA. Which what, it means what, I can't call the teacher when I'm worried about, hey, I've got a student here, he's my patient, and you're the teacher that he's identified as his trusted adult. All I need to do is get a parent signature. I'm not asking for permission for the entirety of Granada High School. No, I just want one person at Granada or Livermore High School to be my go-to person. Parents will almost always sign that. Sometimes it takes some work, but eventually, if it's a serious issue, absolutely you can have that partner. But most of our doctors are not doing that yet. Now, I like to think the ones we train are, because they do school mental health rotations, but school personnel often experience us as parents. So I've been a parent and a professional and a school professional, so I've been wearing all the hats, and school personnel often see doctors as barriers to health. And often it's the great wall of HIPAA. You know, I call the psychiatrist and they don't call me back. I, I leave messages, but you know, it's, it doesn't help. We may also hold similar views of school personnel. They're just doing a job. They're just, you know, they're concerned about their liability. <clears throat> My son's got high risk behavior in school and they're worried he may elope and he has been at high risk for suicide in the past. And they came to the table, but we needed a lot of advocacy. And now we're all working together, but it wasn't easy. It's not an easy path. Um, kids with IEPs and 504 plans. Those are our kids. Those are, for those of you who are gonna be psychologists and therapists and counselors, those kids are uniquely ours. Those are the kids who really typically have some kind of co-occurring mental health condition. And so, as psychiatrists in particular, we have to pay attention. Um, this is just a quick survey of, from a few years back from San Mateo Union High School District. And so they asked the staff, how many of you think, you know, for your professional development, you need more 
professional development for how to meet the academic standards. Oh, that's gonna be so freaking awesome. I can't wait for that professional development. Put me to sleep. So, you know, in 2013, it was like 40%, 2015, 30%, the numbers have just continued to go down. Because they get that, they understand. Yeah, we gotta meet the standard, BFD. But ask them about social emotional learning and they go, remarkably, you know, 60% or more and the numbers are rising. How, you need PDs for how to meet the social emotional needs. And most teachers understand that, but they don't have the skill set because they're busy being, you know, subject teachers. But there actually are curricula made for teachers to be delivered in the classroom. Or you can have a mental health, you can have a staff person come and deliver it. But the teacher, we always have the teachers in the room because the teachers are the trusted adults. How many of you have heard of QPR? QPR training, question, persuade, refer. It's like CPR, if you're worried someone might be suicidal. And that's training you can do online for, it takes two hours. We got all the kids in Palo Alto trained. All 7,000 students were trained, but we also trained the teachers because we wanted them to go, be able to go to someone if they had a question, and it would typically be their teacher. So we know now there's a lot of evidence that school-based mental health programs work. Youth live in schools. We have programs that can be delivered in 12 to 20 sessions, like CBT, like interpersonal therapy or IPT. Um, it's amenable to group structure, it's skill building, it's great. We just need to have instructional time to be able to include it. Okay, so that's where you all come in, because you're gonna go out and have a conversation with someone about something new you learned here tonight. And you, you're gonna learn that you have a lot of power as a citizen. You can go to a school board and you can talk for three minutes about why you believe that mental health is part of overall health and children have to be healthy enough to learn. So, <clears throat> you know, we always try and, this is just another slide about why you do it in schools because the kids are there and you can actually design it very well. And for the most part, you can, it's cheaper, it's easier. In fact, 75% of American youth who receive mental health services say they get their services in school. It's not that they have necessarily a licensed therapist, but they consider going to their counselor, their guidance counselor, for which they may be getting academic support, where they also get their emotional support. And so it's not in the medical sector, it's not in therapy in private offices, it's in schools. We just have to be more intentional about it. And we can't assume that the counselors and the wellness coordinators and the licensed therapists can take care of everybody. They can't. The more licensed therapists you put in schools, the more kids will come. You have to work further upstream, and that's why we are focusing on well-being as much as we are focusing on those kids who really need the most help. So, <clears throat> this is just a slide to say that most students will face some kind of problem in school. That's developmentally typical, but you will also see on this list, maybe a few that look familiar to you. I know that when I was in college in the psychology club, a lot of us were just, were trying to figure stuff out for ourselves or our family members. So yeah, one or two of these, pretty normal for any of us to have. But if you have one or two or more, for more than a week at a time, right? Yeah, there's unhealthy peer pressure. But if it gets so unhealthy that you're not going out to hang out with your friends anymore, and you have to find a new set of friends, well, that could be a problem, right? Fears about starting school or going to a new school. Well, we, that would be typical. But if you're not going to school at all and you're starting to fall behind and you're not interacting with peers, that could be a problem. So these are common issues that students get. One or two of these they can bounce back from. But if you have them for a longer period of time, it gets hard to actually be in school and that's when you might start to notice signs of depression. So the next few slides, and um, how am I doing on time, by the way? Five to seven minutes. Time for questions. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk 
while I go through the slides kind of quickly, and then Allen Hill Foundation is going to actually have these slides on their website, so you can go back to them. Um, depression is common. When we're in schools, we highlight the idea that 20 to 25 percent of you in this class, if we're in a class of high schoolers, 20 to 25 percent of you, before you walk across the stage, I'll just use Livermore and Granada High Schools because they're in my brain, because um, we've been seeing kids who come into the hospital. Um, before you walk across to get that diploma, one in four of you, or one in five, will have depression of some kind. Depression, a medical condition, that can impair your ability to do well in school. We also know that teens who die by suicide, this is the same as for adults, there's a range, but 60 to 70 to 80 percent, there's some kind of mental health condition. It's not the breakup, it's not the bullying, it's not the past abuse. All of those may be factors and they add up. The mental health condition is the thing that's the common factor. Academic stress is a thing, yes. Academic stress by itself, very rarely is the reason someone gets to that place by itself. It's usually sedimented in a number of other stressors. <clears throat> so, depression rates are rising, what can we do about it? Well, primary care now is where we're really paying attention. Just like we talked about building teacher versatility, the other thing we do is build the versatility of pediatricians and nurse practitioners and family docs to be able to screen in the office. So now, the American Academy of Pediatrics requires that all pediatricians do a PHQ-9 once a year after kids are 12. The screens for depression, it's very easy to do. You could do it online, it's one piece of paper. It takes five or six minutes. Um, so, and then there's a number of other tools we use in primary care. So that's another part of the overall solution here. Not just for the therapist, but for primary care and teachers, you see we're getting back to that supporting alliance these trusted adults in the life of a young person. There's so many treatments out there now. There's some wonderful apps. I just listed a few of them that we really like. Calm, Headspace, Cove, Seven Cups. You probably have your own favorites. Um, safety planning. So a safety plan is when you have a young person at risk, you have them identify when you think, start to think about suicide, what do you do when you're by yourself? What are your coping strategies? Who can you reach out to? Who are these people? What are their contacts? So there's an app. How many of you have heard the My3 app? Okay, a few of you. The My3 app, there's a website. You can get it on the Android or the um, <clears throat> Apple portal. My3 stands for my three people. Who are my three people that I would go to if I'm feeling desperate? and you see their face on your phone, you just push a button and it calls them. <clears throat> and this is based on the best practice by Brown and Stanley about how to do a safety plan. Coping strategies, distraction techniques, who do I call, crisis numbers, my therapist, my doctor. <coughs> what can I do to care for myself when I'm not feeling good about myself? And the most important question, the last question is, the single most thing from the single most important thing for me to go on living for is, and they write that down or they put it in the app. So, like my son has this in his phone, and he works with his therapist on it. They tweak it; it's right there. They don't have to look for it; it's on the phone. Right? Every young person has their phone. Now, you might say, but they're not allowed to have their phones in middle school. Well, guess what? On my son's IEP, we wrote that in. He needs to have his phone because his safety plan's in there. He doesn't abuse that, but he, he uses it when he needs it. He's also got some other coping skills on there. Um, so they told me I have to wrap up. I want to highlight a couple of things that we're working on now in terms of the research. So this is just a open source brain slide. Like if you're looking at my brain and you sliced it open and you're looking at my pathways. Um, so this is the frontal cortex here in blue. This is the thing that got you here on time because you've all been to this auditorium. Or if you haven't, you somehow realized you needed a map and this is a beautiful campus, but it's large and I have to get here to get a seat. That's planning. It's being able to plan and grab stuff from your memory, put it into action. These pathways, serotonin. You've heard of serotonin. 
Drugs like Prozac and Zoloft, they work on serotonin. Serotonin is not only important for mood, it's also important for memory processing and sleep and cognition. And it's the area that's impaired in depression. So if you have a parent who doesn't quite buy in that this is just not all drama and they're just looking for attention, if you've diagnosed depression, this is how we said we'd go nuclear. Pull out the brain slide and show them, again, this is just open source, just do a search for NIDA, that's the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA dopamine slide or NIDA serotonin slide, and you can show the connection. If your serotonin is impaired, these are not consistent. If these are impaired, not consistent with good learning. So for the parent who's reluctant to have you bring mental health curriculum in the schools, show them this. Okay, so a word on culture. Now, I notice we have a mix of different cultural backgrounds here in the audience, and I'm gonna move beyond. Okay, so here's how we think about culture. In my training program, in my department, every single human in Contra Costa, Alameda, and Santa Clara County has a culture. Culture doesn't just mean underrepresented minority. Every person, I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. There weren't a lot of people of color. There was like us and the Green Bay Packers players. We all kind of lived together <laughs> and it was all fine because you know, we were really bad when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, but we all got along, but we kind of had different cultures. So I had a culture that I had on the outside, and then when I go home, I'm, I step and I'm in India, and I'm in, my parents are Indian immigrants, and we have cultural values from India. Well, we believe and we see from the research that depression comes together and culture plays a role. Culture can enhance your help seeking, it also be a barrier that there's a lot of stigma. So it's important to have these conversations. Every interaction that's clinical has at least three cultures. There's the culture of the therapist, like their upbringing, their background, how they were trained, their therapeutic approach. There's the culture of the patient and the family, right? So the young person might be different from the grown up. And there's the culture of the institution. What's it like getting help at this hospital or at this clinic? Did you have to wait three months? Was the receptionist nice to you? Does your insurance cover it or not? Are you paying out of pocket? All of these cultural interactions are happening all the time. And a young person can get affected when we don't pay attention. So normally, right, we have the biological factors. Depression runs in families. That was on one of the slides I went through fast. And there are other conditions that may lead to depression that we don't quite understand, but it's in the brain. Psychologically, normally resilient teens stop being able to bounce back. The glass goes from half full to half empty. Everything becomes a chore and becomes negative. And socially, this is what happened to our son. He turned 13 and everything became difficult. We have depression and anxiety in our families, plural. My wife and I and our, our collective families psychological stressors, he was getting bullied in school. Not major bullying, but microaggressions that happened a lot. We weren't aware of it. Socially, the love of his life, he was 12 at the time, 13, turned 13. He found out she was moving to Israel. Now you can imagine for a 13 year old, for the love of his life, that this is like, the, this is his world, right? And he's such an empath. So he was not only sad that he was going, she's gonna move away at the end of the semester, he was sad for her, because she was sad too. So he had like sadness squared. And then he's in a culture where youth have taken their lives at the train tracks. And when he turned 13, within two months, all of these hits started to happen to him and it was this interaction that led him to desperation, and eventually led him to a hospital. Thank goodness for that, but culture is everywhere. The culture of where you grow up, the culture of getting help or not. Can I talk about my problem here or will I be stigmatized? Do I have a trusted adult in school or will they think of me different or damaged? Um, it's very important, culture is everywhere. And what we've been studying is what happens, this is kind of <coughs> complicated, probably don't have time for now, maybe in the question and answer. But the general idea is, 
you have cultural identification. There's many Asian American brothers and sisters, I see you in the audience here, and um, this was originally defined in Asian American populations and Latino populations, immigrants who were coming over, and the young people were having trouble integrating what they're being raised with in their mainstream culture and what their parents were raising with their values at home. So this distancing, this gap, can occur as a result of cultural value differences and communication difficulties, not just language, but also like my parents don't get me, like, oh, my dad's always telling me to get off TikTok, this is from our house. I'm like, they're always telling me to get off TikTok and I, you know, like, why do you have that app? And I say, I wanna see what my friends are posting. Why do you have to see what your friends are posting? You can do it on this other thing, you just do it on, and they say, you don't get me, dad, forget it. But that's a cultural gap. And if that continues, right, we might end up going into this difficulty that might cause distancing. So that concept is called acculturative family distancing, or AFD. And so, because immigrant parents and children possess different cultural values, you can end up having a gap, and the gap can lead to distress, psychological distress. It puts you at risk for anxiety and depression. This is one of the things we study in our program, and Dina Wang Krauss had the earliest cohort. She looked at eighth graders, and found that this occurs in eighth graders. Again, you're gonna get these slides on the Allen Who Foundation website, but um, we have some YouTube examples of um, theatrical vignettes for immigrant parents and their families, like what happens when your teenager says this? How can you respond without, you know, doing something that you feel like is gonna damage them for life because of the way you talk to them? It's kind of humorous. Um, these vignettes were actually written by students about actual things that happened in their lives, and um, they're very clever. We've taken them all over the country, and now they're on YouTube so people can see them. Um, so the last thing I'll do is just sources of strength. This is our suicide prevention program. This was started in the Native American communities of North and South Dakota. They had a lot of deaths by suicide there, and these were not clinicians who developed these. They took the core values of Native American culture and they put them into a well-being program called Sources of Strength. These include mental health, family support, positive friends, mentors, healthy activities, generosity, I put gratitude in here too, um, spirituality, that could be religious or it could be secular. It's connection to something bigger than yourself or connection to a community and medical access. These are the eight sources of strength that were identified and this is part of the evidence-based approach for well-being promotion to get young people upstream to engage in these activities. And what happens is you get peer leaders to propagate messages from those eight sections of the wheel. There is hope there's help and there is strength in talking about what you struggle with, sharing your story, and talking about how you got better. Hope, help, and strength. So this is a high school with sample peer networks. We have the football players. We have the well-connected to school kids in the middle. We have the kids in special ed who are out here. We have students with low attendance who are out here. The kids in special ed, they're not even in the quad. They're kind of like the forgotten group, but they're still part of the community. So what Sources does is faculty identify peer leaders from each of these groups to be the ones to propagate these messages. And that's what we've been doing in the communities, many communities in Northern California, Sources of Strength. And it's been extraordinary for well-being promotion in addition to suicide prevention. This is our website, herdalliance.org, and um, this is the suicide prevention policy. And then I'll just end on this. We publish a toolkit that lives online, and the third edition is coming out at the end of this month. And it basically is a, is a whole compendium of best practices for health promotion, for crisis intervention, and for postvention if there's a loss. And at the end, a number of appendices for focusing on special areas of interest as it relates to K-12 mental health promotion and suicide prevention. So what does it mean to be in special ed and be dealing with a young person who might be thinking about self-harm? What are the cultural adaptations one must keep in mind when working with different communities? 
what are the really important ideas in addiction and substance use as it relates to well-being promotion and suicide prevention. So it lives there. Just do a search for HERD K-12 Toolkit. And these are my colleagues who have collaborated. And um, I think I will stop there so that we have some time for discussion. And I thank you for your attention. And now you have note cards that if you have a question or comment, you can <coughs> write it, hold your hand up, and then I think some people will be coming around to collect them. There's a couple that are coming in that are thematic to other talks. How do we best support our sexual minority youth, our LGBTQ brothers and sisters who are struggling with mental health? So in our toolkit, we have a partnership with the Trevor Project. So Trevor is a great online resource for, for anyone. Um, if you're an ally or if you're a member, if you're gender spectrum, if you're gender questioning, um, lots of resources there that are online, in addition to Bay Area resources for where to get support. I think it's really important for any, if you're, if you're say, LGBTQ and, and you're of an underrepresented minority, uh, say, racially or ethnically in your school, you've been a double minority. And if you have mental health, you feel like a triple minority. It's important to find connections important to find allies <clears throat> and you're probably going to find some friends in a community like this but I think it's really important to find a faculty member to find someone even if you're a transition age young adult to find someone like Dr. Roy or or, or someone else in school that you feel connected to as a faculty person that sense of belongingness is so important that's actually been studied that's a concept belongingness is an idea in college and community college mental health. Feeling like you belong, feeling like you've got connection, feeling like you're part of something that you can go to and feel understood. What's the connection between ADD and ADHD and mental health concerns? So we have a son with ADD <clears throat> and he, I mean, I would say his mental health has been affected a bit just by that. He is fortunate to not have what we call comorbidities. About half the time, you will see typically a learning difference or a learning disability and some kind of mental health issue. We know that there are certain things that help kids with ADD thrive in young adults. We talked about belongingness, that's especially important. You know, if you look up famous people with ADD, you will be reassured that there are several famous people who had dyslexia and ADHD. Um, Robert Needham, the CEO of JetBlue, um, uh, the, um, Virgin Airlines guy, Virgin Airlines guy um, what's his name? Richard Branson. Richard Branson um, the person who started um, FedEx Kinko's. There's, uh, there's musicians, there's lots of people. Um, Robin Williams, I mean, you'll, you'll see a whole list. Um, sometimes, that can be helpful for young people to feel connected to others. Um, but I think it's more important for them to know friends, know peers in their school struggle with the same thing. We know, for example, from great work done by our friend um, and our mentor um, uh, up at Berkeley, his name's escaping me now. I know him as Stephen. He was the um, chair there. I apologize, Steve's gonna look at this on um, He's going to look at this on um, the media and go to the foundation site, and he's like, "Shushank for <laughs> my my last name." Uh, Hinshaw, thank you, brain. Stephen Hinshaw. He's written a number a number of papers, in particular on girls 
and the unique risk that girls with ADD have. So, as you may know, girls, when they get ADHD, they tend to get the inattentive type more than the others. Boys are, you know, they get the combined type more often. When girls do get the condition, they tend to get the inattentive, and they tend to present with anxiety and depression earlier. Why is that? Well, we're kind of socialized to not talk about these things, right? So girls may suffer quietly in our society and most cultures. Girls advance and develop socially and emotionally earlier than boys. There's a certain expectation that's heaped on them, and so it may feel less okay to ask for help. So they tend to present later, after some of the self-esteem issues have turned to depression and anxiety. So that is a connection that has been studied. Um, <clears throat> the, are anxiety disorders treatable without resorting to medication? How do we deal with anxiety in the classroom? Well, actually, anxiety disorders are probably the most important success story in children's mental health because we know that anxiety disorders usually are treated without medication, at least to begin with. Mostly what happens in anxiety is cognitive errors. And so even though it's not all about CBT, when it comes to anxiety disorders, cognitive behavior therapy, changing the way you think in order to help change the way you feel and ultimately the way you behave, will result in not avoiding the thing that you're afraid of because part of your treatment is getting slow graded exposure to the thing that's making you nervous or the situation that's anxiety provoking. First in the office, you know, and you've got homework, you're doing it at home, you're doing workbooks, and then over time, you're gonna confront that issue that's making you most nervous. Um, so absolutely, anxiety disorders not only are treatable, that is the evidence base. Um, for moderate to severe anxiety, we typical, typically will combine it with medication. Sometimes the medication will get you to a point where you can actually engage in the therapy, but that may be hard to do without medicine. Again, remember the picture with the brain and the picture where it's biopsychosocial, cultural. Sometimes the bio is so strong that without medicine to deal with the bio, we can't take care of the social and the psychological because the bio is getting in the way, the brain is getting in the way. We talk about depression as a brain condition. I wear the silver ribbon. This is the brain condition destigmatizing pin. People say, oh, that's an interesting pin. What? I haven't seen that one. I see the colored ones, it's a silver one. I say, oh, I'm glad you asked. It's a silver ribbon because brain conditions, mental health conditions are brain conditions. Um, question about <clears throat> what are some best resources for K and grade one teachers? Um, so I'm gonna actually share an email address for those of you who've stayed till the end here where you can pose your questions. Ms. Lyra Ghosh is gonna help me with this. L. Ghosh at Stanford.edu, is that right? L. G. H. O. S. E at stanford.edu. The questions I don't get to here. Um, I'd like to post a couple resources there. Um, <clears throat> there's a wonderful program called Cognito. Have any of you heard of that? Cognito with a K. Cognito, K-O-G-N-I-T-O. -O. If you go to their website, you can see the samples. So this program has been published now um, in the Journal of School Health where elementary school teachers can learn how to be having these conversations with the kids they're concerned about. Um, it's a virtual online role play software suite. And school districts actually have paid for this and they've used Prop 63 money to cost share in order to get, um, in order to get the training for their teachers. Um, Mental health first aid, youth mental health first aid is very good, it's something the state is rolling out and you can get that for the adapted younger kids. There's something called the good behavior game, any of you heard of that? The good behavior game is probably the most robust intervention for children in second and third grade. Um, 
One just needs to learn it, and it's, it's basic social-emotional learning. So in the promotion section of the K-12 toolkit, just to a search heard K-12 toolkit, um, we review the social-emotional strategies and list specific programs with evidence in that section. As a teacher admin, how do you deal with parents that are in complete denial about their child's mental health? <clears throat> Sometimes, even if they've described a plan to take their life, they don't get it. Okay. With absolute humility and total respect, I would say, that's where you go nuclear and you pull out the brain slide. Pull out the brain slide. Okay. Go to NIDA. Search NIDA serotonin pathways. It's a simple discussion. Probably this parent may be from a culture where mental health may not have the same language. There may not be a word for depression. We certainly don't teach about it in schools. Why? Because we're gonna give them the idea, right? You can't teach about suicide. If you teach about suicide, we're gonna be the next Los Gatos or the next Palo Alto. We can't do that. Well, that's why we have a law. We know that suicide rates are increasing. We know that 16 to 18% of American youth have seriously considered suicide. Think about that. It's almost one in five from 12 to 18. Okay, these are the teenagers of today. Now, it doesn't mean most of them attempt suicide. Six to eight percent make a suicide attempt. Six to eight percent. Think about that in a big comprehensive high school of 2,000 kids. That gets the administrators to pay attention, and two to three percent will land in the emergency room because they made a serious attempt. So, yes, you could introduce the culture of fear, especially if you've got a student you're really worried about. I think you have to meet the parent where they're at. Try to understand what the fear is about. Sometimes parents simply have a fear that their child will be stigmatized or they'll bring, it'll be shameful to the family. So maybe you need a cultural broker. You might need someone from that community to be at that meeting, to be able to talk about mental health. Like, I myself offer myself as a cultural broker. I can talk about the fa fact that the inpatient unit, which I helped to start, I had to hospitalize my own child there. I, it wasn't me, it was one of my colleagues. But then I got discharged to the IOP group, Intensive Outpatient, and there were his peers, and there were the parents that I saw on the weekend when I was on call as the doctor. And the look on the parents' face like, even you, Dr. Joshi, yes, even me, because I am a parent and I'm human. And mental health is for everyone. And mental illness does not discriminate. People can get mental health problems. It doesn't matter what your walk of life is or what you do, who your friends are, what your background is. Um, it's very important. It's very, that was a very important moment for me. So I would say, as a teacher admin, share stories, make the connection. If you're trying to correct, I'll put that in quotes. I, I'm very humble when it comes to parenting. <clears throat> I feel like I have way more questions than I have answers, even though I've been doing this for 20 something years. You gotta meet the parent where they're at. What are they concerned about? Connection before correction. Connection before correction. I wish I wrote that. I wish I thought about that. Lyra, why didn't I write that? That was uh, Phoebe Moore, who was a postdoc with Dr. Margotini, who wrote that. She said, research is me-search. Research is me-search. And it was her colleague, Rebecca Rielan Berry, who teaches parents how to connect with their kids. It's a treatment called Parent management training. It's where you help parents to deal with their oppositional, defiant, pain in the ass, six and seven year old kids who won't listen to them. But it's an extraordinary treatment. It builds connection. It brings the love back in the family. It's evidence-based. Alan Kasdan at Yale developed it. Anyway, the basic principle is connection before correction. And for me, this question goes to the heart of that. That if there's something about the culture of that family or that larger group, that makes it hard to talk about mental health. Bring it back to the brain, bring it back to learning,
healthy brains make better students. Our job as a school district here is to make sure our kids are healthy enough to learn. Your student, Mrs. So-and-so, we want them to access the curriculum. And right now, because of this brain condition that's been diagnosed, the pediatrician diagnosed it. By the way, that's another destigmatizing way to get the message across. Get the doctor or the nurse practitioner to meet with the family and say, yeah, you know what, we did the PHQ-9 and I believe your son has depression and we're worried about him. So again, back to the supporting alliance. Don't do it in a vacuum. The teacher who asked this question, you're part of a supporting alliance. Try to connect with a pediatrician. Try to connect with a cultural broker, another parent from that community who might be able to engage them in that message. Okay, I think I'm going to have to leave it there. But I want to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you for bearing with my voice. So funny to thank the foundation, Lira, Dr. Boy. Oh, and I have flowers. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's very kind of you. So have a wonderful night. And so what can you do about this? How can one person change the mental health landscape? Okay, Dr. Roy, this is gonna be on your exam, so write this down. Okay. One conversation at a time. Everyone, please go out or post or tweet. Tell one person what you learned today. Tell them about the, the things that we talked about. That's how stigma changes. That's how the discussion of mental health changes. One conversation at a time, okay? So go out and talk and listen. Thank you very much.